Okay, well, we'll start. And I'd like to um, offer a very warm welcome to Aldona, who's come back to us, as it were, who was a past student on the Writing, Practice and Study program and has recently published this wonderful novel. Now, although I cannot read this novel in this translated form, I am very aware of its content because Aldona worked on this novel when she was a student with us. Right from the beginning, Aldona presented herself as someone of enormous potential and sensitivity and a kind of poetic understanding of how one could take everyday events and find magic in them. And through exercises and essays on the program, this was extended and developed into a prose practice that eventually became a series of stories based on her real life experience of working in a kilt shop, a kilt hire shop here in Dundee. Aldona, you're here as our guest of Imagine Spaces, which is our research center that Gail and I established to investigate and champion new forms of writing and thinking that we think can happen on the page through a new kind of essay form that allows for imagination as well as critical thinking. And Ian is here with us as a practitioner of these essays. And Neil is with us as an ex-student of the WPS program, who also wrote essays as part of that. So we're a lovely little group here to celebrate your novel and to hear you talk about that space between a real place, as you lived in Dundee and worked in the kilt shop, and the imagined space, which becomes the stories that you write about that experience. Welcome. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I am a little bit uh, nervous, to be honest. And, you know, I am not used nowadays to talk in English and uh, more to give interviews in English. But uh, I really appreciate uh, my time in Dundee and uh, the teaching and studying at the University of Dundee, which opened to me completely new ways of writing. I have been writing because I have been a journalist in children magazines and in, uh, I have been writing popular psychology articles, but uh, uh, learning with you, Kirsty, and you, Gail, and uh, other people whom I met, it opened me the, the ways to look, as you say, this reality and to create this imagined space that um, that I have never imagined before. So, so I'm really uh, happy and thankful and uh, grateful that uh, you give me your time after work hours and uh, and you share the joy of my book, which is obviously you know what it is. These are kilts in Lithuania. People sometimes are asking. <laughs> I have a girl in my office. She says. You know, it's very nice, but uh, what uh, what is the skill to? I say, <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> Do you know this? Uh, uh, you know, I don't want to say skirts, but I had to explain to her that you know these Scottish skirts. She says, oh yeah, I know. So I say, well, that's the kilt. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if we could talk for a little about that space between um, the known and the imagined and one language and another language because when you started working on this book you were writing in English and we talked about didn't we at that time the kind of charm and the interest in adjusting the English version um, accordingly so this word skirts for example yeah. um, mm -hmm. that becomes part of the text and part of the way that you as a writer are imagining what you're doing. Can you talk to us a little about the challenges of writing in English and and then how that was to come back to the project and write it again? Uh -huh. 
Well, uh, I remember you, well, you and uh, Jim, who is uh, sorry not with us now, how you were supportive, supportive of me. I was not native speaker, and I think Annika in my class was also not native speaker, but Annika possibly has graduated in bachelor's, uh, I think undergraduate, she has graduated in university and then in University of Dundee, so she has uh, better skills of English. But you were very supportive, and I remember this. And now, because I teach in English, <laughs> and I teach students who are uh, not native speakers at all. I have never had a native speaker, but I have students who are mainly Lithuanians, but of course I have Erasmus students who are from different nations. And I always remember what you said to me, that when I express something which is not uh, very British or which is not a set idiom or known expression or which I, uh, for example, translate something from my language into English, it sounds fresh to you. In my language, it might sound a cliche and in your language, it sounds fresh. So there are these things that you have uh, between the two languages that uh, there is the space for uh, movement and for freedom and for interesting expression. And finally, now I am married to Estonian men. I don't speak Estonian. We speak English at home. And uh, I live again between languages. And uh, even more so he lives because he lives in Lithuania being an Estonian. But the, every day I have, uh, I face this uh, between languages and uh, I guess maybe I enjoy it. I don't know because <laughs> this all has been my choice. So possibly I, I enjoy this uh, space being uh, not committed to one language. Also to have many possibilities and also to borrow something from English because sometimes I borrow English expression and I translate it into Lithuanian. And again, it sounds interesting and fresh. And it sounds a little bit foreign, but I I write about Scotland, so it has to sound a little bit foreign. And I write about a person who is uh, uh, living in exile or immigration, and uh, uh, she feels foreign, so she thinks in a way that is not uh, bound to one language. So in, a minute, in a minute, Aldo, and I'm going to ask you to read a small section from the novel in English, if you would. Uh, but just before you do, I wonder if we could press further at this lovely phrase of yours, living between languages, because that, in a way, seems to describe so perfectly and succinctly what Gail and I are after in our own deliberations and teaching and thinking about what we call essaying this idea of discovering what it is we think on the page as we go along and to create a kind of literary and critical space that has this kind of liminal quality that doesn't sit in one place or the other, but is very happy to be part of both or many and to use language in such a way that it is fresh, to use your word, and surprising and sometimes a little bit unnerving in order that we think again. Can I ask you now, please, to read a little from the novel and maybe set it up for our guests and those who are tuning into the film uh, to give a little bit of context or background <laughs> before we plunge in? OK, so uh, I found uh, I have one uh, um, one short story from this book uh, translated into English, so I will read uh, that which I have. And uh, a little bit of context would be that uh, I started to write uh, this book as a collection of short stories. And uh, I was thinking to write short stories about uh, uh, Eve or Eva, who is working in the guild hire. She's Lithuanian and uh, about Annabelle, who is the owner of the Kilt Hire, and uh, about Anna, who is uh, a girl who works in a tattoo uh, shop. And uh, I thought that these will be short stories, which will be separate, but in a way connected. 
Then I was talking to my friend here back in, in Lithuania and she said, you know, nobody buys short story collection. Well, I say, OK, <laughs> she says if they are connected to each other, you just see and I don't know if in English you have this expression, but in Lithuanian it would be something like novel made of short stories, like novelu romanas. And and she says, but in the end you can drop it made of short stories. You just leave novel. And I say, well, OK, so that's how it is. You know, I sent to the publisher saying that this is novelu romanas, like novel of short stories. And in the end on the here it is this Romanas, which means novel. So uh, so it is uh, still in essence this collection of short stories because there is no so bound, uh, you know, relationships between uh, the people and so on. But uh, mainly the stories come from three women. So this is Yava, Annabel and Anna. And there are stories from uh, men who are connected to these women. So this would be um, uh, Annabelle's, uh, she will have this love relationship. Oh, sorry for for this uh, spoiler, but uh, she will have this uh, <laughs> romantic involvement with this man uh, not about whom I will read now. So the short story. Uh, how long should I read? Maybe just about a page, possibly, yeah? A little bit. About five minutes, that would be nice. Yeah, OK, OK. I have, sorry, I have this uh, sun coming here. Is it, uh, maybe not, yeah. Can I just uh, close the window? Could you, because then we yeah. can yeah. see you better. Yeah, yeah. I'm really sorry. So, so uh, the story is called Damascus. I am from Spain. This is his standard answer to where I'm from. This is a lie, but Khaled doesn't care. Anyway, he is from a country which is much, much hotter, which has more dust, less water. The buildings there are from lighter stone and the rubble from older civilizations. When he dreams about home, he is always walking carefully along the wall, looking at the carved balconies bulging out into the street. He is darker than them, but so is the Bulgarian hairdresser working down the road. He doesn't care about the shades of darkness. At home, he was also among the darker ones. He doesn't lie about his name, though. He is Khaled, Spanish for the locals, possibly of Arabic descent. Possibly he doesn't speak any Spanish at all. If somebody asked him why and when he stopped being Syrian, Khaled wouldn't know what to answer. In the first five years, when he was running a takeaway next to the station, he told the Scottish about Damascus. He talks about his culture, religions, the famous Damascus market. He answered why he came here and whether he carried a Damascus steel knife for protection. You know, the city is not very friendly for foreigners. At some point, his country changed from being exotic to dangerous. Suddenly, everyone knew everything about it. The details of his life were scrutinized by foreigners as if it was theirs. No, we don't have democracy. Yes, when I think about it, life was tougher. He didn't make a conscious decision. Just once after being asked, he answered differently. To be Spanish is different. Oh, we were in your country this summer. Isn't it lovely? Sangre and siesta, hola amigos. It's roasting hot and sunny. You must be depressed here. I'm used to it, have been living here for 15 years. Yes, I get enough of sun and whiskey is great. This is enough for small talk. In time, he understood that the eccentricity of Damascus led nowhere. Spanish beaches burned by ruthless sun are much better. Both them and him are foreigners there. 
On that day, the woman with sad eyes came for the second time. When she opened the door, it felt as if she brought the rain with her. Mist covered Harlot's dry skin and his body sighed with relief. What's your name? Did he ask or was only intending to? Annabelle. Did she answer or he just knew it? He passes by Annabelle Kilts where every day before climbing up the street to his coffee shop. He has seen her many times. He had thought she was around 10 years older than him. She has excellent hips and a gorgeous smile, he realized now. It's not hard to find a woman. They come to Harlot all the time. They buy coffee and rolls. They talk. They come in the morning during the lunch break or after work. Before going home or just after leaving it. He feels the gaze on his shoulders when he turns his back on them to pour coffee. Always wearing short sleeve. sleeves, he lets their eyes wander on his smooth brown skin. Fabulous. Aldona, thank you so much. And there are things there, of course, I remember and recognize. <laughs> and you're giving us a lovely taste of this wonderful uh, novel, which, yes, is a series of short stories and has all of the pleasures of such interconnection where we see characters from the, the points of view of the three characters and has all of that kind of tenderness, free and direct narrative and intimacy. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Everyone feel, Neil just needs to be readmitted. Everybody feel free to come in um, by way of response because we're just going to open up now into a much more general discussion about these lovely <laughs> melded forms. You know, when you were talking earlier, um, Aldona, about the way that this novel, this set of cycle of stories comes out of experience, it makes me think of writers such as Sheila Hetty, whose mm -hmm. work is very clearly both autobiographical and fictional, and who also um, can be said to have essaying qualities because of the way those two aspects of the work come together. And I think your work has exactly the same quality because um, the experience of you that is in this book melds with the experience of Eve and her fiction and becomes something other. But in a sense, the project of reading it and writing it is a project of discovery and of trial and of great risk. When you put the work together, um, to what extent were you using some of those essaying capabilities that you were also practicing as part of the degree in writing practice and study? Um, those issues of inquiry, of not necessarily being certain where the story was going, asking yourself questions about the kind of narrative even as you were writing it? Uh, well, I, I don't remember how I decided to continue the story. I, when I came back from Dundee, I had this uh, uh, my dissertation was uh, called The Kilt Hire, and it was uh, mainly stories from two points of view, from Annabelle's and uh, Eve, and it was uh, also half, uh, half short stories, half uh, script. So it was experimental form, and I didn't know if I would do anything with it. And I really don't remember how I decided to translate some of it. So I translated from English into Lithuanian. And, um, and then uh, uh, I was simply decide writing. Um, I was uh, writing further, but uh, not thinking about what this will be. And then once I had uh, with my students, because I teach uh, creative writing for my students, I, I gave the task about structure. So I brought them like uh, big sheets of paper 
and I said to them to divide it into three and to find the emotional, you know, uh, the highest point and to describe the characters. And uh, while they were doing it, I did myself because the story was sitting uh, somewhere there in the back of my head. And I thought, well, I need to somehow to do something with it. And so I uh, was dry, drawing the structure and then uh, I, while doing it, I understood what might happen because uh, I am fascinated by short story overall because I like how things resolve in a short, uh, well, you know, in a short space. Um, there are no major events. I like small events because I think that our life is made of small events, not... Uh, necessarily something huge, you know, and these small events stick together, kind of grow into something big. So I wanted to do this uh, stories about, I wanted to write about women, I wanted to, to it to be a, a lot of little, like a, you would see a necklace of beads and to, 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 to talk about it like that. So then I kind of understood what uh, will be this uh, development and uh, and then I knew what I need to write more like uh, what parts are missing because I had the kilt hire the beginning of the kilt hire I had uh, Annabelle uh, the beginning of Annabelle I thought she might uh, have a romantic involvement with that man who uh, was uh, kind of dark skin, then I thought that this woman couldn't have an affair with that man <laughs> and possibly, possibly this kind of woman wouldn't have. But then I thought, you know, I will give her an adventure to do this, you know, to have this uh, kind of affair. So I was thinking of challenges, what could be and um, and that's how I did it. And Josie is uh, joining us. Ooh, I'm so sorry, everybody. Hi, Josie. <laughs> so complicated when you've got more than one team person name <laughs> in different accounts. And I was in the university one. I couldn't get out of it. And I tried to get onto my home one. I'm here. So lovely. I'm so glad that you're all here. Josie, it's lovely to have you with us and lovely to have the you know, teammates back together again. We've just been talking about the pleasures of, of essaying and a style of writing that constantly allows itself to ask questions. And Aldona's just been describing how the concept of structure came much later in the process, after the imagination had already been set and trained. And I'm sure this is speaking to all of us, Ian and Neil and you, Josie, um, in terms of the kind of writing we make that seems to be the very, very essence of, um, of essay work that Puts a, finds a structure and starts managing the materials much later down the line, but lets itself first ask that question, what if, as Gail put it, many months ago at one of our conferences. Ian, is all of this resonating with your own practice, for example? Well, well, I, well I think so, because I, I've just been watch, listening to, and watching uh, a few of Agnes Varda's films, and it's very much about this polyphony of sound and idea and allowing... Um, a degree of sort of um, natural expression to emerge. And it sounds as if you are, that is what you're encouraging in your short stories, perhaps. The voice of Annabelle uh, mm -hmm. to, or, or the voices uh, in the kilt hire shop to try and to, to evolve and to emerge and to sound throughout. I'm, I'm not sure, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there something quite sort of, we you spoke before about the forum being quite experimental, and I just wondered if there was something of that new wave, you know, that 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 where, where, where there's a random element, where, yeah. Yeah, there is a structure, but there's there, there's a, there, there's a seeming randomness within that structure, which allows a certain freedom, fun of freedom, and you know that sort of. Anyway, I'm driveling yeah. over here. I, I <laughs> Yeah, I wanted it to be a kind of briefing structure. Not everything, not all the knots very tightly tied and, you know, not everything very uh, resolved 
I tried to resolve as much as possible not to leave the reader hanging, you know, wondering. But still, uh, the ending is quite open and all, well, it's all quite open, honestly. Yeah. And as you talk about polyphony, yes, yes, uh, one of my readers uh, uh, said that, uh, you know, in the back of the book it is written that it is about three women, but because it's just a short uh, place where you can write things, what it is about. And uh, she said, it's not about three women, it's about all the world, it's about the men who come to the kill shop, it's about the men who live with those women, it's about everything, it's not about three women only. So, yes, I think you're right that it is uh, kind of polyphonic. Can I ask you, is that a, a part of a, a Lithuanian tradition of writing in that way, of allowing these voices to emerge or... I mean, in a sense, although you said you were approaching it, you were writing it in English, and you had it at certain points to, to you had to stop and translate to try and get maybe again, I guess, control over it. Perhaps I don't, I'm not sure. But I just wonder if um, is that, are you influenced by any um, other writers or, or or culture of writing in that way, which allows for that capture, for that um, you know, for you know. Multiple voices, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the capture of multiple voices mm -hmm. within this open mm -hmm. essayistic structure, in a sense. Mm -hmm. you know. As uh, if I compare Lithuanian literature and uh, British literature or literature in English language, I can see that Lithuanian literature is much more experimental. And uh, I have to be honest, this is the thing that I don't like about it. Because in Lithuanian, you cannot find a normal novel. Like you have to look for it. If you want a novel where somebody would have a real story, which, you know, all the developments, we don't have it. We have like one, two, three. We had before Soviet occupation, we had writers. Then we had Soviet occupation with all the things that happened. And after that, we are kind of emerging again. So what I think that we are developing into the, not into the more experimental writers, we are developing into more conventional writers. So we, we are having this other way, you know, developing into the other uh, direction. And I think that my novel, or as the short stories collection made into novel is, um, kind of traditional even because it solves it is solves the problems it is uh, it is uh, quite conventional it's we have a lot of uh, essay writers and we have a lot of talented essay writers lithuanians are very good in writing essays and essay collections and uh, m they are much better than uh, than uh, in writing novels i would say so so we have, uh, yeah, quite quite strong tradition of writing essays. Can I jump in and just ask? I don't know if I'm sorry because I'm late today. <laughs> <clears throat> I probably mucked up all the format and everything. But just as you were saying that, um, Aldona, you know, saying that, you know, you're you're, you're quite conventional in this form. I am and conventional. Back to, yeah, it's very <laughs> conventional in this form. And uh, but I wondered how your Lithuanian readers have taken to the book and don't they think it's surprising and amazing and not conventional at all because it's not you know perhaps because of its content or how has it been received uh by your fellows um, well uh, i still am to hear normal voice from critics or literary critics because uh, the ones who read my book are either my co-workers or friends or relatives or friends of the friends and they all are excited <laughs> and they all say how lovely so easy to read well that's the thing i can't believe it is very easy to read so interesting so easy to read and now we have this war waging in the neighboring country almost and you know and your book is just sitting there in the evening full of love and good life and you know and also my husband says he left to give me this freedom to talk so he says that you say to them 
that this is the tribute to the Western society. Nowadays, we have so much, you know, the values are compromised and, uh, and of course, this war and everything. And this is the tribute to Western society, how things should be and how they are working. And this is true, yes. Well, uh, this is uh, this is about a lot about Britain and about British society. It is a lot about it, and uh, it's mainly about things that I admire there. So, it is um, well. I hope that you will get uh, tourists from Lithuania <laughs> who will want to see at this certain kilt shop. shop, which yeah. I'm a little bit worried about. <laughs> yeah, I think the the hill town will become overwhelmed. <laughs> well, that's why I immediately um, got in touch with our PR department at the university. And I've also dropped a note to the lifestyle editor at the Courier <laughs> newspaper, because there is a whole lot of fun to be had for Dundee featuring in, in the book in the way that it does. But you've also touched on something else here, Aldona, with Josie's question, which is to do with contexts for reception. And the way um, um, the way that the wider world influences how books are marketed and how they're received, and there's no doubt that at the moment, um, everywhere, there's a feeling of the novel having to take on themes of great seriousness and moral import um, in order to do its job. Whereas, in fact, of course, the novel can and has always done every, anything it pleases. However, it does make a difference in terms of getting readers and critics on board. Um, and this idea of something being somehow lightweight, a domestic, uh, women's novels, a sentimental novel, these kinds of terms are used to dismiss really important literature and instead to bring in, you know, these kinds of books that seem to be speaking to the time and so on. But in fact, as you've indicated, sorry, Gail, as you've indicated, you're doing very serious things in terms of cultural inquiry and experimenting with this space between the imagined and the real and language itself. Gail, sorry. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's kind of a, a puzzle or conundrum that I'm trying to work through, which is partially to do with um, a cerebral response to as a critic to what I'm hearing you say and the kinds of things that you're reading so I'm thinking okay you know what I'm hearing it's really interesting to do with um you know with home the unsettling and the defamiliarizing of of where is home and how does one think one's identity might be there's also a lovely thing about inside and outside where the man walks down the street he sees you see as a reader what goes on in his head he sees what goes externally you know and so there's a lovely interplay between inside and outside which is kind of a possibly I have not read the whole novel but possibly as a kind of analogy for thinking about what it, the home is of, of course inside and what is outside the home you'll all of these themes about domesticity about where is home whether home is everywhere or somewhere whether home is a place or not a place really a state of mind you know this is all of the stuff that's going on in my head as a critic my question is when you start the novel and when you write yourself into the novel do all of these themes come to you or is this meet is this a case of stepping back after you've written the story and the world of the story that you've imagined that some of these themes start to emerge well uh, i remember how you Kirsty, gave us the exercise in one of your classes and it was uh, i think it was uh, to write down uh, what would you like to write about? Something like that. Well, some some kind of summary, what you would like to write about. And then I wrote that I write, want to write about women. I want to write a story about women. So this was what I knew. And of course, I started because I didn't know what to write about. And you told me, you all told me to write about the Kiltshire. <laughs> I started to write about the Kiltshire. And... 
then it became to me uh, obvious that when I write about the Celt hire in English and I think in Lithuanian and then I have this uh, old people phoning from all the Britain talking in all the accents that uh, language and me belonging or not belonging will be the topic. So I don't know to answer your question, Gail, I don't know how consciously I was uh, focusing on that topic. But in the end, the book is about the, exactly the things that you were talking about. And uh, in the end, yes, and I <laughs> wrote about it uh, in the back of the book. I wrote that this about uh, being uh, alien in, uh, you know, about being uh, at home in the foreign country and feeling not always at home in your own country after you have lived in that other country and about uh, finding friends and about what is French in one, one culture and another culture and about all these things. So I think that first uh, I put it into words when I was uh, applying for scholarship, which I didn't get. But uh, anyway, I was applying for, for scholarship from Lithuanian research, no, uh, Lithuanian Cultural Council, I think they give scholarships. This is similar to Creative Scotland, where they give scholarships for writers. So I had to describe my projects. And I think that was the first time when I wrote that this is about that. Of course, I didn't put it so nicely as you did, but you know. <laughs> what but... supplementary question, what surprised you when you actually wrote about the world that you were writing about? What really surprised you about you know, because stories change and things change. Yeah. Well, in my writing process, what surprised yeah. me? Well, uh, uh, first, what surprised me is that I developed as a writer. <laughs> well, that came as a great surprise. But really, the stories that I started and the stories that I ended with are different. And I hope that the readers don't mind or they appreciate. I hope so. So one thing. And another thing was that... Uh, uh, that I was discovering what will happen to my characters. Like, uh, I would know that uh, this Eve in the end will go home. That was for me obvious. But I didn't know why would she go home. Or I knew that uh, Annabelle would uh, first uh, have an affair with Harlet and then she will uh, split up. And I didn't know why would she split. I would. I understood how. Well, I was talking to my friends also, and I said to my friends, you know, there is this woman who needs to have an affair with the younger man, and I don't know why would she have it. He is younger. He is uh, kind of Arabic descent, and you know, and she is posh and not so. And she says, well, she wants sex. You have to describe that. No, and I was thinking. Well, really, <laughs> that's a good point. So I found out this and then I thought, how will she, you know, she has to leave him. Why? And then I I was writing and discovered it. And uh, and she left him because of the same reason, Gail, that you said that he was not at home there. And she was very much at home and she thought, you know, I'm at home. He's not at home. This is very temporary. Something like that, I think. I don't know. It's open. It's open for discussion. <laughs> I love the way our discussion is bringing us to a consideration of what it is to write. That it's not simply the acquisition of certain skills, and it's not even paying attention to characters and what they're going to do and the notion of narrative itself, we seem to be moving to a study of sensitivity. And I loved your me your metaphor, Ian, of the camera, that kind of cinema verite and the even, you know, clutching the microphone as you make the film and, and um, taking this recording device into life and gathering material and becoming increasingly sensitive to that polyphony that you both talked about, and then starting to do something with that that becomes art. 
Neil, I wonder if we could bring you in at this point because you're living at the moment in Spain. You just mentioned before you're going to come home for a bit and a bit, but then you might go back, he said. Are you finding your experiences as you work on your own writing to be <laughs> both chastened and enabled by this kind of polyphony that you're hearing around you with other languages and other ways well, of being? Uh, yes, other languages. <laughs> It's other languages that uh, kind of drew me to come out here, especially for the subject matter that I'm doing, which is about bulls that win bullfights and what happens to them. And I have my man who's in who's in Scotland, who's left and coming down here to spend the rest of his life with them. But that's not me. <laughs> but but if I'm listening and I'm talking to people. Some of it's in Spanish and some of it's in in English. I'm trying to get the balance of which which is more expressive. Because then in Mercia, they're very expressive here when you speak Spanish. But you can't put that expression into, I can't put that into English, in English, on the page. So I have to think about, and there's so much going on here, even though this is a, this is just a novella, this is, I couldn't make this any more than that. But I'm learning so much from being here, from soaking it in, and then listen to where the guys talk and the way, they, and the way, and, and, and the, the, the men who tell me about these, uh, about these beasts have a, have a, a passion about them that uh, I could never understand. So I'm learning from it all. I'm taking both languages, the same sort of thing. I'm trying to get a balance of what uh, what works and what doesn't work. But this is just first draft. Who knows what's going to happen at the end? You know, <laughs> as you said, you know, when you when you revisit it, uh, no doubt it'll change. So, but this is all—it's just cramming too much into my head. If that makes any sense. In some okay. sense, it's interesting what you what you what you're all saying there about about other, other, the the role of the writer, what it is the writer's doing. Because I wonder if the writer is not a curator. In that respect, there's lots of you're, you're listening to sounds and ideas, uh, participating in dialogues and, and and whatever. But ultimately, you're arranging things, you're putting things together, and trying to shape things. That, uh, that that you might be the author of it, but in a sense you're also, well, perhaps more the curator of it, curator of ideas. I don't I don't know. That's maybe that's more essayistic in that respect, where, where you you bring various, you know. Um, I, I just think in terms of um, when, we, when you were talking about you're, you're allowing your friend to influence the dialogue, you know, mm -hmm. or influence what happened next. You're thinking, well, what would Annabelle do? What would she do? And your friend says, well, Annabelle wants. You know, and um, and you think, oh, that's right. She's a real person, isn't she? You know, and then you and you go about writing something else. So you you allow for those the extraneous, the outside to come in and influence what it is you're writing. But um, anyway, um, you know. but it's, and Ian, that's interesting. And to that extent, are we talking about a kind of collaborative curatorship? Then I think so, and the collaboration within you, in a sense, you you're, you're pulling in a variety of resources. You know. You know, um, as well as um, inviting others to participate as well, mm -hmm. in what you're doing. Maybe, maybe it's a new form of writing. What maybe that's what writing is. You know. Yeah. Well, I thought it was interesting what you said, Aldona, because you sort of wavered between. You were sort of slightly going down the path of saying that your characters, despite setting out as being real people and turning into characters, but they they surprised you in how they turned out and and I wasn't quite sure if they were all shaped by conversations with friends or what you imagined but the, you seem to be sort of on the cusp of saying that the, you know there was a sort of an intuitive thing that they they develop as characters in front of your eyes on the page somehow um, like magic, you know, and you know how we, we hear of writers who say, well, I had no idea, you know, what that character was going to do. And then it just did that. And I really didn't want it to do that, but it just did it. So there's this sort of weird sort of tussle between the, the writer and this sort of intuitive, ethereal, weird thing. And you know me, I'm always keen on the ethereal, weird thing. So I just wondered, um, I just wondered if, if there was any of that, or you did find that that was shaped to rate I, it or whatever I, sort of quite firm I don't uh, know what we could use as a I, <laughs> I have read uh, I don't remember who said so but uh, possibly it was originally in English I know in Lithuanian that some things you write 
and some things they write themselves. And I find this in writing that sometimes you are shaping a sentence, making it uh, shorter or more beautiful or uh, or trying to find a better expression. And then when you find it, it becomes something uh, more than you have written. Possibly, Josie, you are writing poetry, you know that, that you are shaping this line which would be perfect and, you know, would sound perfect. And then it says much more or much a different thing than you have intended to although you have written it you are kind of controlling it and so on so i don't believe this characters running away without catching them because in the end <laughs> still i i think yeah, that i am point. very much in control of them but i think that there is this kind of freedom in this uh, way that still characters are lines on paper letters on paper and uh, in the end they become images in somebody's head so from this paper to somebody's head there are already there is a transformation yeah and i cannot control that to no, that end that has it so, so much yeah and yeah so so i think that uh, i just uh, we all possibly give up this control a little bit not completely and uh, and we allow for this magic to happen, which I don't like to talk about magic here <laughs> because this is work and this is craft and this is something that no, you absolutely. have to do. Yeah, but uh, there has to be some kind of freedom, yeah, possibly. And uh, what else I wanted to say about this collaborative writing. So for me, this is the only recipe that works. I had uh, seven stories uh, translated from English, made from you, so I had them seven. And I stopped writing because I didn't have time. I am working more than full time in the university. I have uh, uh, workshops, I write articles for press, so I, no, I am very busy. And then I had this writing group uh, who didn't want to quit when I finished. Well, there were seven meetings, we, we were having seven meetings and that's it. And after those seven meetings, these women said, you know, we want to continue. We cannot, we cannot let you go. If you, if uh, this, uh, you don't, I said, I will not think uh, of writing exercises for you. I will not, uh, you know, I will not do this organizing job. They said, okay, you write yourself. And that's how it, uh, and that's how I wrote the rest of my stories. We were meeting uh, every two weeks, and for every two weeks I had a deadline. So that's how I wrote them. Mm. Otherwise, this is my well, this is my only only way to do it. And uh, of course, Yen, you are right saying that this is collaborative writing because uh, well, this book has been read by at least five people from you know from little bits. And of course, they were influencing. And of course, we were discussing. <laughs> and now I am writing a book where I wanted to write a crime. And I start from a dead from the main character. She's dead. And she's starting telling the story backwards. And I was thinking, how will she die? And I'm thinking, this is heart attack. And then I have to, to talk to the surgeon, some heart... Um, doctor to find out how it could be and so on and then we were talking with my this writing group and one of them is gastroenterologist the doctor and she says it can be allergy <laughs> i'm thinking bingo <laughs> really it can be allergy <laughs> <laughs> so it is so that all the world influences writing but it is so because writing is a part of the world like uh, it is not something that I don't like this image of a writer who is uh, somewhere secluded in the, uh, I don't know, in the black uh, room somewhere alone, struggling. I, I am not that kind of person and I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. I, for me, it would not be possible. But I guess people are different. Mm. Well, I wonder if upon that heuristic and collaborative note, we might wind up the formal part of this presentation, the filmed part. Um, and thank you, Aldona, for sharing with us a marvelous book. I can say this 
without having read the Lithuanian <laughs> version on the basis of all the work I've known so well uh, as your teacher and reader, but also in a way even more than to celebrate this novel, to hear from you about your willingness to take risks, to listen to others, to be part of that polyphonic adventure in translation and language, and to be part of a kind of generous spiritedness that we think is at the heart, don't we, Gail, of our imagined spaces adventure, that's always alert to the ideas of others and always keeps opinion and the idea of a set conclusion as ideas that are to be kept in abeyance as we rather go on to discover fresh truths and hear new ideas. So you've just been the most beautiful spokesperson for everything that we care about. And we look forward to publishing a little of this uh, wonderful series of stories on our website and to helping you celebrate all that you've done. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for having me. It has been a pleasure. Thank you, thank you.